pray that our hearts will be encouraged um, as we hear what the Lord has for us tonight. And before I share what he's put on my heart, let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity I have once again to share your word. And I just pray, Lord, that it will minister to our hearts. It will encourage us, Lord, in our walk with you and, again, challenge us, Lord. And I pray that you'd open our ears to hear and our hearts to receive. And anything that is accomplished, Lord, we'll be sure to give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If I was to title this message, it would be, Prayer is a Battle Plan. Prayer is the Battle Plan. I saw a saying on Facebook this week, and it read, prayer is not a backup plan, it is the battle plan. And the Lord started dealing with me on prayer and and what that is. And I want us to take, well, first question I would like to ask is, how is your prayer life? How is your prayer life? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to take a look at that, verses 16 to 18, says, rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Putting everything in God's hands. When you pray continually, we are putting everything in God's hands. We pray throughout the day, about every moment of the day, because it's continually, we pray about anything and everything. So we, whether it be just giving him thanks for the day, just throughout the day, whatever it is, we come across something and we pray about it. But we are to pray continually. And I will tell you that prayer is one of the greatest benefits of the Christian life. It is one of the greatest benefits of the Christian life. And possibly one of the most neglected. One of the most neglected that we have. Prayer is a battle to be fought by believers every moment of our journey's life. Why do I say it's to be fought? Because when we start to pray, who comes in and tries to disrupt us? The enemy does. So when the enemy tries to disrupt us, it becomes a battle to really get in there and fight and pray for what what we're asking the Lord. But it is where victories are won. Our enemies are defeated, and our hope is refreshed. That is what our prayer is. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. These powers of darkness are the spiritual forces of evil who energize the ungodly, oppose God's will and frequently attack the believers of this age. So that is why he said it is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the, princip- the authorities and the powers of this dark world. But I wonder, have we pushed prayer to the sidelines of our faith? Have we pushed prayer to the sidelines of our faith? Do we really believe in the power of prayer? Do we really believe it? I want us to take a look at Second Chronicles 7.14, which was mentioned this morning. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. God's promise, although it was originally given to the Israels, applies equally to the people of any generation. If my people pray, he will hear us. He will heal our land if we pray. I know that we all face battles. Everyone's battle looks different. But one thing that we share is a God who wants to fight for us. That's what we share. He wants to fight for us. But we must ask for help. Not try to do it on our own, but we must ask God for help. It is through prayer that we invite him into our situation. It's through prayer. Tonight, I want to take a look at Jehoshaphat and how he defeats the Moab and the Ammons. We are are going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to break up this chapter because I'm going to show you different things through this chapter. So we're going to start with 2 Chronicles 20, 1 through 4. 
It says, after this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Minuites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazan Tamar, that is in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. First thing we want to see here is Jehoshaphat inquires of the Lord. He inquires of the Lord. He calls a fast of all Judah. He doesn't go around other nations asking them to help him to defeat them. No, he goes to the Lord first. How often do we get on the phone to talk to someone about something and we don't go to the Lord first, but we are to go to the Lord first. It should be our first plan of attack of all life's battles, not our last resort prayer have we put it on the sideline or do we actually use it let's continue second chronicles uh, 25 through 12 then jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of judah and jerusalem at the temple of the lord in front of the new courtyard and said lord the god of our ancestors you are not the god are you not the god in heaven you rule over all the kingdoms of the nations power and might are in your hand and no one can withstand you our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built it in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or the plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But, here, but now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. You see how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us in an, as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So he was very honest. He was very honest with the Lord. And he based his prayer and confidence knowing God has power over all people and situations. God has been faithful to his people in the past and in the present. God's people are helpless without him. God's promises are a sure foundation for faith and God's active presence among his people means deliverance and victory. So at the end of his prayer, he says, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. They are waiting on the Lord. And that's what he asks us to do. This makes me think of King David. David knew about trouble. Think about all the times he was in trouble with King Saul, running for his life. Take a look at Psalms 121 verses 1 and 2. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And guess what? That is where our help comes from. It comes from the Lord. We must trust him with all our hearts and ask him for grace to help us in our time of need. So let's go back to Jehoshaphat. Everyone stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon um, Jezreel, son of Zechariah, and he stood in the assembly. So we're going to pick it up and see what God had to say through Haziel, 2 Chronicles 20, 15 to 17. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the paths of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position. Stand firm and seek the deliverance of the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. So they were to take up their battle position. Stand firm and watch the deliverance of the Lord that he would give them. They had to rest 
his direction. Move forward in faith. They had to march down against them, take up their positions, and stand firm. They were given directions. And one of the hardest things to do is to trust the Lord when you're overwhelmed. One of the hardest things to do. Yet the Lord told them, you need, you need to march down to where they are. They, they gave, the Lord gave them direction. And in our lives, he gives us direction. But what will we do with it? So I wanted to show you, there are other situations in the Bible where they had to follow God's direction to see victory. Um, we can... We will come back to Second Chronicles, but before I do, I want to take a look at Joshua 6, 1 through 5. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its kings and its fighting men. March around the city once with all of the armed men. Do this for six days. Have, you, have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in the front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times, which the priests blow in the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. This was Joshua's first battle since Moses had the death of Moses. And you have to know he had to be a bit overwhelmed with what he had to do. You have a million people behind you and you are leading them. So you know he's a bit overwhelmed. Of course, the, the, there was someone that had met him along the way when he was praying and told him he was of the Lord's army, but that which gave him some encouragement. But I want to tell you a little bit about Jericho. It covered about eight acres. It was a fortress city, not just for its residents, but for the, those that all those that inhabited round about it, nearby countryside. There were wall, their walls may have been as much as 30 feet high and 20 feet thick. Not an easy place. Jericho was considered to be invincible, protected by the gods of the Canaanites. The capture of Jericho was the key to Joshua's um, whole war strategy. It was the key, for it would demonstrate that Israel's gods was superior to the Canaanites' gods. Thus, the, de the defeat of the Can Canaanites was certain. So he needed to conquer that. But guess what? Joshua had to follow God's instructions. And when he did, he got the victory. And we have to do the same. We have to follow God's instructions. Gideon, he had to severely limit his army. In Judges 7, Gideon had to go down from 10,000 men to 300 on God's direction. But when he did, they had victory that night. And they had to stand firm and hold their position as well. As they surrounded the army, which was too numerous to count, and there was only 300 of them. They had a jar and a, and a trumpet. And they had to stand their position, blow that trumpet, smash those jars. And it caused the army to go in confusion. And they had to stand their position and then go after them. Then you had King David when he defeated the Philistines. We're going to take a look at 2 Samuel 5, 23 to 25. It says, so David inquired, inquired of the Lord, and he answered, do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. As soon as you hear this sound of the marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move quickly, because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as the Lord commanded, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. David inquired of the Lord. Again, we must inquire of the Lord. We must pray to him. And the Lord gave him instruction to wait for the sound in the trees before attacking. So he had to hold his position until he heard that. But once he heard it, he went forward. These, all that I just told you, they, they trusted the Lord and they had victories. We need to trust the Lord and then have victories as the Lord guides and directs us. But let's go back to Jehoshaphat. After he was given the word, he bowed his face to the ground, and the people of Judah and Jerusalem uh, fell down and worshipped the Lord. But let's pick it up at Second Chronicles 20, and we're going to look at 20 through 30. 
It says early in the morning, now they've been given instruction, and it says early in the morning they left for the desert of Tikkah. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out ahead of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and the Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them, and they finished slaughtering the men from Seir. They held a help to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Be- Be- Berica, where they praised the Lord. This is why it's called the valley of Berica to this day. Then led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. The fear of God came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. They began to praise and worship God. They didn't wait for the victory to give him praise. They did it before they ever got down to where they needed to be. They gave him praise along the way, and they sang to him. And as they were singing and praising God, the Lord began to move. God destroyed Judah's enemies, and they never had to lift a sword. So I would ask, Do we praise and worship the Lord in the midst of our battles? Do we give him thanks for the victory that's coming? Or are we worried? God's way is often contrary to what we normally expect. But God's way must be our way. In Isaiah 55, 8, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. God's ways and thoughts are, are not those of a natural person. But human minds and hearts can be renewed and transformed by seeking him, by our prayer time. Then our thoughts and our ways will begin to conform to his. Remember, our battle belongs to the Lord. Our battle belongs to him. This morning we sing out a song out of the hymnal, His grace is sufficient for me. And in verse 2, it reads, When the tempter brings confusion, and I don't know what to do, on my knees I turn to Jesus, for I know he'll see me through. Then despair is changed to victory. Every doubt just melts away. And in him there is hope for every day. That's what happens when we go to the Lord in prayer and we begin to give him our battles, he begins to move, but he's looking for that praise and that worship before the, the battle is won and, and stating, Lord, I believe you. I know you're going to give me victory and I praise you for it. I don't know what battles you're facing in your life right now. I don't know how overwhelming the battle or battles seem. I don't know. But I believe the best plan for each of us is to worry less, pray more, worship more, and trust God to lead us to victory. That's what I believe. Let us march into our daily battles trusting God, listening for his direction, and singing praises to him. Remember, God is greater than our enemies. And the battle belongs to the Lord. And so tonight I want to encourage you. The battles that you are facing. 
go to the Lord and be honest with him and say, as he did, they they looked to the Lord and said, all eyes are upon you. I cannot handle this, but my eyes are upon you to see what you will do as I begin to pray, sing, and worship, knowing that you have victory, whatever it might be. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity I've had to share your word. And Lord, each one of us face battles on a daily basis. Some we, we are not as big as others, but nevertheless, they are battles. And so Lord, I pray that this will be an encouragement to them that the battle really does belong to you. And as we really seek you first, not, not our friends, not our family, but we seek you first, and then we listen for your direction, then we just begin to sing in our hearts, knowing that you have victory. I pray that it encourages our heart this night, believing you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand and we'll be dismissed. <clears throat>